Boatworks today is sponsored by Total Boat and Alexia Yacht Coatings, as well as supported by the generosity from the beautiful folks over on Patreon. Thank you so much. Well, hopefully this looks and sounds a little bit better, especially compared to last week. Papa's got his gear back. Now it is windy. I don't know how much this is actually coming through, but... So, welcome back everybody. Hope you are all having a fantastic Father's Day weekend. Uh, my name is Andy with Boatworks today, and this week we're going to be talking about epoxy. Specifically, what it is, what you can do with it, how to mix it, and well, we're also going to do a little bit of a test at the very end, comparing three of the different hardeners to see how big of a difference in gel time using fast, medium, or slow hardeners makes in about 80 degree weather. So with that said, let's get started. So starting from the beginning, what exactly is epoxy? Well, depending on the type of epoxy that you're using and how it's mixed, it can actually be a number of different things. But broadly speaking, uh, it, it's a type of resin that's commonly used in the marine industry and other industries as well that it's a two-part system. So you have your resin and then you have your hardener. And when those two are mixed together in the correct ratio or proportion, then it eventually cures to a solid state. Now, depending on, again, the type of epoxy you're playing with and what you're mixing into it, I mean, it can be used for anything for wetting out uh, fiberglass, you know, for doing composite repair or even, you know, straight up fabrication. You put in certain types of fillers. All of a sudden, now you can turn that into a type of a fairing compound. Uh, epoxy is wonderful at sealing, you know, specific, specifically when you're working with wood, you know, or, or anything. Uh, if you want to basically waterproof something, epoxy is going to be one of your best friends. And also, it's a great general adhesive, again, if you're going to be doing woodworking where you need some, you know, kind of an extended working time, you know, to get the joints and everything kind of uh, clamped together and everything in place. Epoxy is also awesome for that. Now, as far as the types of materials that you can use epoxy with, honestly, it's pretty much anything. Uh, as opposed to like a polyester uh, resin, it doesn't melt like plastics and foams and that kind of thing. But uh, as far as what it shines at, it works great with like doing carbon fiber or Kevlar work. Uh, most types of fiberglass, whether it's going to be your biaxial, your cloths, or well, like I said before, any of your foams or even plastics, the one kind of caveat, and it really depends on where you're from, is going to be referring to the type of glass called chop strand matting or CSM. Just kind of a real quick backstory. Chop strand matting, typically, at least what it, how it's sold here most commonly in the U.S., uh, it's a bunch of random strand fibers of, of uh, glass that's held together with a styrene-based binder. Now, in order to use chop strand, you know, that I'm referring to here correctly, you need to use a resin like polyester or vinyl ester that has styrene, which melts that binder and makes the, the fiberglass much more pliable. Now, there is a, a, a type of chop strand bedding that uses a powder binder. Now, supposedly it's available here in the US. It's not very prevalent and I haven't played with any of it, so I don't know how well it actually works with epoxy. But I, I do know like, when you get over towards Europe uh, or other, other uh, countries that that's how it's typically sold is a, a, with a, a powder binder versus a styrene binder. So even though epoxy is very routinely used in the marine industry, it is not the only one. Now, I would say epoxy is probably a close second as far as how, how much of it's used uh, kind of overall, uh, with number one going to polyester resin. Now, polyester, one advantage that it has over epoxy is that it's well, much less expensive, to be quite honest. And also, it, it, it sets up faster. And you know, there's some other little variables I think we're going to touch on here a little bit later in the video. And then finally, in last place or third place, is going to be your vinyl ester resins. Now, as far as what are the differences between epoxy and, say, like these other resins, you know, poly or uh, vinyl? Well, basically, without really getting into like a really, really deep dive, get, you know, into the chemistry aspect of epoxies, uh, just kind of broadly speaking, they're very similar in how they're used. I mean, you can use them in similar ways for wetting out fabrics and that kind of thing. But epoxy, like when you're bonding things, epoxy does a much better job at either one of those two resins for bonding and it, for moisture prevention. I mean, like if you want to put on a barrier coat, like anytime you apply a, a barrier coat onto your hull for blistering, uh, it's epoxy based. It's also got a longer shelf life, like a, a polyester resins are generally speaking, they're good for about 12 months from the date that they're manufactured. Uh, whereas epoxies, I mean, they can be good for years. I mean, years. I don't really know that they have a shelf life specified for epoxies. I'm sure there is one. I just, I have never really heard of <laughs> one being published, but you know, I'm not saying it's not out there, but they will last years, uh, even if they're not stored in the most ideal conditions. Now, longer shelf life, they also have a longer working time, which when you're doing larger repairs or layups, uh, is a very, very welcome benefit. Uh, it's nice to know that if you're working on an area that you can have upwards of, you know, maybe 45 minutes or an hour or longer versus, say, like 10 minutes with poly or vinyl ester resins. 
Now, it's also a lot more versatile. I mean, there are a lot more fillers and little, you know, goodies that you can add in and mix in with epoxies than you can with, say, like your polys or your vinyls. So in that respect, it, it makes it a little bit more, well, quite a bit more versatile. And finally, last, it, and what I would consider you know, one of the most important is it's, it's more stable uh, compared to these other two. Now, by stable, what I mean is, you know, when it's, when it's cured, uh, it, it still continues to cure for a number of days or even weeks afterwards. A lot of times you'll see uh, manufacturers do what's called a post-cure on, uh, on their epoxies or their resins, and that's just basically raising the temperature to really cook it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, so it's fully cured. There is, yeah, it kind of speeds up the, the whole process overall. Now, epoxy, when it's cured, or as, as it's curing, it shrinks much, much less than, say, like your polys or your vinyls. Uh, for, and that becomes particularly important when you're talking about fairing. And especially if you're going to be, you know, with the end goal in mind of going to be doing a paint job. Uh, just as a quick little example here, let's just say you do a, you're getting your hull ready for a paint job. You do a bunch of fairing using some polyester-based uh, uh, you know, material, um, which works great. I mean, don't get me wrong, but if we're comparing the two, epoxy is going to be better. Now, you go through, you do all your fairing. Say you leave for a week or you come back uh, you know, a couple weekends later to actually do the painting. Uh, that material has shrunk more, so you may need to do a little bit extra, very fine you know, sanding uh, before you can actually come in and start doing your priming and your painting. Whereas with epoxy, if you do your fairing, give that a sand out, uh, most likely within a week, two, three weeks, a month later, uh, it's going to be exactly the way you left it. So there isn't going to be anywhere near as much shrinkage. That always sounds weird saying. But in any event, um, in that respect, epoxy is going to be a much more stable resin to be working with. Now, you may be thinking that epoxy is the, the be-all, end-all of all resins out there. And to that, I'd say, not so fast there, Sparky. I mean, epoxy is good, don't get me wrong, but it's not perfect. There really, there is no such thing as the perfect resin for every situation. There's just, there, there's not. Depending on what you're doing, some resins are going to be better than others. So epoxy does not hold the crown 100% of the time. Now, as far as, you know, what some of those drawbacks are, uh, compared to some of the other resins, uh, epoxy does have a relatively short laminating window. And by that, I mean, you know, being able to go over top of something without having to sand it. So basically you can do a layup, you know, say give it a half hour, 45 minutes, you can come back over and if you're still within that laminating window, you can lay up more material right over top, it'll chemically bond, it works fantastic if you're able to hit that laminating window. Now the way that you test for that is if you're able to touch the surface and you can leave a thumbprint, you know, so if it leaves your fingerprints in there or if you can dent the surface with your fingernail without, it, you know, without anything sticking to your finger, you're in good shape. Then you can go right over top of that, laminate it, and you'll be you know, very good to go. Now, if you go to do that and you're not able to make any kind of an indent or imprint on the surface, well, you've missed that laminating window. And depending on the type of hardener that you're using, it's really hard to give, you know, you say you've got, say, 10 minutes or 30 minutes or an hour. It's, it's going to depend on a lot of variables, the humidity, the actual temperature, the type of hardener you're using, you know, so on, you know, so on and so forth. But if you do that, the fingernail, fingernail to fingernail or finger print test, <laughs> if you're able to make, a, make that mark in the surface, you're going to be good to go. Now, but that window is relatively short. Now, the other drawback with epoxy is that you, epoxy can pretty much go over top of any other type of surface, whether it's plastics, gel coat, or polyester-based you know, materials like gel coats or vinyl esters or anything. Epoxy can go over top of pretty much anything. Now, the reverse of that cannot be, you know, cannot be said. So it's pretty widely held, you know, held spread that uh, polyester materials, specifically like your, um, your gel coats or any other type of like uh, polyester-based laminating or polyester fiberglass uh, resins, they, they don't do very well long-term over top of epoxy. Epoxy over top of that, no problem. Polyester over top of epoxy, generally speaking, no bueno. Now, I have done in the past some testing, you know, this is going back probably five, six, maybe even seven years ago now, uh, where I have done some testing doing uh, basically gel coat tests over top of epoxy. And if you are very, very meticulous as far as, you know, keeping track of how long the material has cured, making sure that there aren't any surface contaminants on there, that the surface has been thoroughly prepped, in certain situations and on small areas, I do think that it would be okay, not ideal, but okay to use the gel coat over top of an epoxy. But 
be, if I'm going to be dealing with a large area, whereas, you know, kind of taking a step back thinking, well, okay, well, if this tends to backfire on me, it's a lot easier to come in and, and fix or do a touch-up on a small area. If you've got to do a large area as a touch-up, especially as well, like a redo, that just sucks, all right? Yeah, I don't know that it's worth the chance. I mean, epoxy is great, but is, I don't think it's worth taking that risk. So I kind of uh, have gone back to that whole idea that it's just not a good idea. I mean, can it be done? Yes, uh, if it's done 100% by the book and, and it's just spot on. But I really, at this point, I really don't think that it's worth the risk, especially on large areas. You know, again, like I said, if you want to try it on small areas, yeah, go for it. If it backfires, it's not the end of the world. But I would not, I would not take that risk uh, if you're going to be doing any kind of larger area at all or anything that's going to be time consuming. Now, something that is unique to some epoxies, not all, but some, uh, specifically during the curing process, is a thing called amine blush. Now, basically, it, it's a byproduct of the curing process. And what that is, it, it's like a waxy, kind of oily film that develops on the surface of the epoxy as it's curing. Now, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's a water-soluble byproduct. So, I mean, you can easily wash it off with, uh, say, warm water and a Scotch-Brite pad. But what that amine blush can do is, well, one, it will inhibit the, the curing process of any polyester base materials going over top. And even if you were to try and go over top of that, say, with uh, like some more, an additional layer of epoxy, regardless of the type it is, uh, that blush layer or that amine blush layer will, it'll inhibit being able to get a good bond between those two layers. So uh, it's not a big deal, but it is something that is unique to, a, to some epoxies. And again, in order to, to manage that, uh, give it a good wipe down with, uh, or scrubbing with warm water and a Scotch-Brite pad, let it dry. Then at that point, then you can come back in and sand it and get, every, get the surface prepped uh, for any successive layers of epoxy that you're going to be going over top with. Now, when I started this, I said that amine blush was something that was prevalent in some epoxies, but not all. Now, generally speaking, you're, you're going to have more issues with uh, blush developing in your, your higher ratio mixes of epoxy. So like your 5 to 1 epoxies, your, your blush seems to be a much more prevalent in your 5 to 1 uh, types of mixes versus in your 2 to 1s. Now, you start getting it down into your 2 to 1s. For whatever reason, I'm not a chemist. I honestly, I couldn't understand it if somebody even tried to explain it to me. I don't, I don't get it. Chemistry is not my thing. I just know how to deal with it and how to work with it. Uh, but when you start getting down into like your one to ones and your two to one uh, type epoxy ratios, uh, you, they'll actually market it as you know blush for amine blush free, which is great. But you, like again, if you're going to be dealing with your five to ones specifically in areas where it's more you know higher humidity. Uh, that, that tends to be you know, a, a factor that really draws out a lot more of that blush, say like if you're going to be working in like a, a cooler or a dry climate. Like just for example here in, in Wisconsin, well, back in the past in Wisconsin, uh, I mean, our, 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 our summers don't get, I mean, you'll have a, maybe a handful of days that where it's, it's just hot like it was you know, last two weeks. Uh, but for the most part, we don't get you know, temperatures like you do down south. So up here, and our humidity is usually very low. So I mean, blush up here, has pretty much been a non-issue, but you start going down, you know, towards, uh, you know, further south, you know, Florida, Alabama, you know, anywhere down south, you're going to be running into blush, uh, specifically with these five to one ratios, um, epoxies, you're going to be running in that pretty frequently. So touching on epoxy ratios, uh, you're going to notice when, you, when you're looking around, you're going to see epoxies that are like mixed at a one to one ratio or a two to one, three to one, four to one, and even a five to one. And basically what that means is, uh, let's just say, for example, we're going to be talking about a two to one uh, epoxy type mix. That means you're going to use two parts of the base for one part of the hardener or the catalyst. And as far as what the differences are between, say, like a five to one versus a one to one or a two to one, honestly, there is a really, really geeky uh, chemistry type explanation that I could try and fumble my way through and sound like I know what I'm talking about. But the reality is, on the chemistry level, I couldn't tell you. <laughs> But I can uh, you know, kind of dial it back a little bit and give you a little bit more of like a, a, a real world uh, kind of a comparison. So when you start talking about your five to one epoxies, uh, those are ones, those, those are the types of epoxies that are pretty commonly used when you're doing like say uh, uh, layups, like you're wetting out fiberglass or Kevlar or you know, whatever it is material you happen to be working with. Now your five to one epoxies, generally speaking, they tend to cure very hard, very stiff, um, which is good, but it also, because they cure so hard, it also tends to make them a little bit brittle. They don't flex much. Now, you take that and you compare it to, say, like a two to one epoxy. Uh, your two to one epoxies still are going to cure very hard, just not as hard and stiff 
as the five to ones. So at the end of the day, what you're gonna have is you're gonna have a surface or a laminate that's gonna have a little bit more flex to it before it actually, before the material or the surface fractures. So a little bit more pliable, not much. I'm not saying you're gonna be able to bend this stuff around like a pretzel. I mean, it's, it's still hard as a rock. It's just not as hard as, say, like in your five to ones. Now, as far as the type of epoxy that I generally prefer to use, I actually prefer using the two to ones more often times than not. Uh, basically, just because it's, it's a little thinner viscosity, it's, it makes it easier to kind of work it into the fabric. Uh, it does, again, kind of what I was just touching on, it does sacrifice a little bit of stiffness, but I, again, I, I think the differences there are going to be fairly negligible. Uh, but I, you know, as far as working with it with wetting off fabrics, I prefer the two to one. Uh, but five to one is, you know, don't get me wrong, you, it can certainly be done. A little bit more effort, not much, uh, but it will give you a stronger laminate using a five to one. But the two to one still is gonna be more than adequate for almost anything that you're ever gonna need to do. Now, when it comes to mixing epoxy, there's really only one cardinal rule that you really have to follow, and that is you have to strictly adhere to the ratio of that particular type of epoxy, whether it's a one to one, two to one, five to one, whatever it may happen to be. It has to be mixed to that ratio. It's not like some of the other resins where you can, you know, juice it up a little bit extra with uh, some hardener and it'll cure faster. That won't work. Uh, whether if you're high or if you're low on the hardener uh, compared to what it's, uh, you know, the ratio is supposed to be, it won't cure. It will be sticky, it will not set up, and you'll have to scrape all that crap off and start over. Been there once, it's not a fun day. Now, as far as the actual mixing process, you can do this two different ways. You can either go by weight or you can go by volume. Now, looking at it by weight, uh, you will get a more accurate ra or ratio if you go by weight. However, it's not as straightforward. So just as an example, a, a two to one epoxy, you know, it's, let's say you pour out 100 grams of, of your resin or your base, you don't add 50 grams of, of the hardener. Uh, there's a difference in density or the specific gravity of those two materials. So when you're going by weight, you're not actually doing a true two to one. Uh, for 100 grams of, of resin, you're going to be adding closer to like 45, 46 grams of the hardener. Now, compare that to if you're going to be mixing it by volume. Going by volume, it is a straight 2 to 1, 5 to 1, whatever the epoxy is, it is a straight ratio. So if you pour out, uh, say, 10 ounces of, of resin or the base, you're going to add 5 ounces of the hardener. It's just, it, it's much, to me, it's much more straightforward. So now going by volume, it is slightly less accurate, but it's still within the, 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 the means of acceptance. I mean, it, it's still gonna set up perfectly fine. So for me personally, I mean, yes, if you wanted to you know, break out the scales and kind of play around with those, you're gonna get slightly, slightly more accurate ratios. But as far as uh, you know, uh, ease of mixing and just being able to keep, you know, keep on with the process of whatever it is you happen to be doing, uh, I personally prefer just mixing by volume as it's just much more straightforward. Now, when it comes to the hardeners that you're gonna have available for mixing with your epoxy, uh, you have some options. I mean, specifically if you're going to be talking about your two to one or your five to one epoxies. Now, generally, you're, you're, you're going to find that you've got uh, options for a fast, medium, slow, and in some cases, even like a tropical, you know, type of hardener. And the way that you, you kind of decide which one to use is really dictated by the temperatures that you're in the environment that you're going to be working in. So, for example, these are going to be, you know, just rough ballpark temperatures here. But say your, your fast hardener, that's something you're gonna to wanna to use in like your cooler temps. Say, just as an example, if you're gonna be in an area that where it's say 45 upwards up to maybe 60 degrees Fahrenheit, your fast hardener is, is gonna be what you're gonna to wanna to use. Otherwise, the, the curing process is just going to be extremely slow. I mean, you may come back 24 hours later if you use the wrong hardener in cool temps, and it may not be set up. Uh, it probably would set up eventually, but it's not gonna be within a, a workable, you know, working time, I guess. So your fast hardeners generally excel in your cooler temps, say, again, rough, num rough temperatures here, 45 upward to 60. Your medium hardeners, you know, I would say if you're gonna be working in 60 to 70 degree Fahrenheit temperatures, medium is gonna serve you very well. Uh, you start getting into your slows, now that's when you start getting into your warmer temperatures. Uh, let's just say your, an average slow hardener is gonna be used in like your 70 to 80 degree range, and then finally your tropical uh, is gonna be used in your 80 to 90 or, or above uh, type temperatures. Now that's not to say that you can't cheat it a little bit. Uh, for example, like in my old shop, you know, I generally kept it around 65 degrees. I always used a slow hardener just because I wanted that extra working time. I mean, there is there is always kind of like a teeter-totter balance of, you know, kind of uh, what you can and cannot do. Well, you can kind of use, say, like the next uh, sp uh, speed lower, I guess, as far as hardener goes, to extend your working time 
up to a point. I mean, just as an example here, if you're going to be working in an area where it's going to be 60 degrees, uh, use if you're not going to want to use a tropical hardener, right? <laughs> <laughs> same, uh, same thing on the other side. I mean, if you're going to be working in uh, something that's going to be 80, 90, or 100 degrees outside Fahrenheit, uh, you're not going to want to use a fast hardener because you'll probably have, I don't know, maybe five minutes of working time, which is not going to work out well for you. So, uh, you know, so you can kind of cheat a little bit, uh, but uh, as an overall, I mean, so you, you match the hardener or the speed hardener uh, to the environment that you're going to be working in. And we're going to be doing a quick little demo here, kind of showing what the, what the, the gelling time is between a slow, medium, and a fast hardener here in a minute. Uh, but one more key aspect I want to just kind of touch on here is if you want to, you can, the hardeners are intermixed or interchangeable, or you, you can mix the hardeners together. So, I mean, if for whatever reason, if you wanted to mix, a, say, like a fast and a medium together, for whatever reason, you could on one condition. You still have to stick within the same family of, of uh, epoxy that you're using. So for example, uh, you're not going to want to use uh, a hardener that's designed to be used as a f in a 5 to 1 epoxy. And you're not going to want to take that and use it in a, in a 2 to 1 type ratio of resin. Uh, same thing in reverse. So I mean, as long as you're sticking within the same family of whether it's 2 to 1, 5 to 1, whatever the ratio may happen to be, you can intermix any of the hardeners within that same family. You just can't mix them with, a, with the, the, the resins from a different ratio family. Sounded really confusing. Hopefully that made sense. So for this demo, I'm going to be using a 2 to 1 epoxy. And really what I'm looking at here is I want to compare the gel times between using the fast, medium, and the slow hardener. So to get started here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pour out 4 ounces of the base into each of these cups. And then, uh, because I'm pouring in four ounces, this is two to one, then I'll be mixing in two ounces each of these different hardeners. And once that happens, well, then we're going to start the clock and see what our working time actually is between these uh, different hardeners. Five minutes later, it is 2.46. The fast hardener has come up to 101. Medium, 94. And slow, 90. It is uh, right now 2.49. Uh, and fast hardener, it's already starting to smoke. Uh, I'm not sure if that's coming up on camera. Yeah, she's starting to smoke. And the temperature on here is 290, 200, 302. <laughs> and it's starting to smoke. Uh, on the medium hardener, around 103, 104, give or take. And then on the slow, we're still in good shape. We're under 100. So fast hardener, didn't make it 10 minutes. And uh, I'm going to have a bucket of water on handy. And this is reading 314, 315 degrees. All right, so what's the takeaway here? Uh, well, going back to last week, a lot of the things that I talked about in last week's video, I'll, I'll put a link for it, I think it's right up in this corner. Um, a lot of the little tips and tricks that I talked about last weekend would have gone a long ways to slow down these, the gelling process on these, each the fast, medium, and slow hardeners. Uh, number two, you really don't ever want to leave six ounces of resin, regardless if it's epoxy or poly or vinyl, you don't want to leave six ounces of resin just sitting here in a cup, right? Again, uh, epoxy, just like the other resins, they, are, they cure through an exothermic reaction. So as they start to cure, they, they warm up. They get warmer and warmer and warmer, and as that happens, that gelling or the curing process goes faster and faster. It's a snowball effect. So one of the main takeaways that, or one of the main points that I would emphasize here is if you're going to be mixing up you know, fairly decent sized batches, uh, get them mixed up, 
get them out into a thinner layer, whether you're pouring it directly into fabric, into a paint tray. Uh, actually, somebody last week, uh, I think it was over on Patreon, uh, made an excellent suggestion. They said they, they take the paint tray, but they set the tray on ice. Brilliant. <laughs> I mean, it's going to give you a, a long, 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 regardless of the hardener you're working with, a very long working time. So uh, just kind of overall here, the, uh, again, these are thick pores or basically thick amounts of, of epoxy to be just sitting in a cup when it's 80 some degrees out here. But uh, just kind of a taking a step back here, the fast hardener, that started to gel at five minutes. The, the medium was between 10, about 10 minutes in. And whereas the slow, that actually went to around 20, 22 minutes. So you had about well, four times the working time on the slow hardener as compared to the fast and almost, well, basically double uh, compared to the medium. Hornets. Hate hornets. <laughs> and on that note, I think I'm gonna wrap this up, but first I, I just wanna emphasize, if you did not see last week's video, a lot of the tips and tricks that I showed there would have more than doubled the working time here, even with these thicker amounts. So again, if you haven't seen that, go back and check out that video. The, the quality, the audio quality kind of sucks, but the information is still solid. So as always, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found this very helpful. And if you did, please hit that thumbs up button. And if you're not already subscribed, hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. Thank you in advance, greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions, comments uh, regarding anything you saw in here or in last week's video, please leave those down below. I'll do my best to get back with you. And as always, thank you for your time. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you next week. This has been a Boatworks Today Protection.